Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Environmental Social Justice. Today, we have a very special guest, Mr. Asby Brown, all the way from Japan. So welcome, Asby. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank awesome. you so much. And um, the exciting news for today, we're doing something a little different. Usually we talk about energy and um, renewable energies. And my favorite topic, ESG, today is a little different. Asby has a book that is coming out very shortly called Just Enough, fantastic title, Lessons in Living Green from Traditional Japan. So Asby, you moved to Japan in 1985 from New Orleans. What prompted that? Well, I have to say that it, it was my interest in Japanese wooden architecture. Uh, I had been exposed to that at college. I was at Yale College uh, studying uh, sculpture and architecture and uh, learned about these fantastic techniques that had been uh, you know, being used for over a thousand years. And I wanted to learn more about that. Uh, and I was very fortunate to have made a short trip in 1983 and met the last great living temple carpenter. His name was Sinekazu Nishioka. And he was in his 80s at the time. Uh -huh. And in, initially, I, I thought I would, I wanted to be his apprentice. But I was, I was in my late 20s then. And I, I wasn't really, I think, temperamentally suited to seven or eight years of obedience and head bowing. So instead, I asked if I could document his work. And he said, yes. So I went back. I got a grant from the Japanese government for graduate school. Oh. I went back, entered the master's degree program at University of Tokyo, and ultimately spent three years researching uh, Master Nishioka's work. And that just led to the rest of my life. Oh, wow. That's all. That's all. That's all. That's all. That's all. Mm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I did, you did provide me with a, a advanced copy of your book, so I was able to go through it. The design, the the... Uh, hand-drawn designs you've done are remarkable, but there's so much in that book. I mean, I don't even know exactly how to begin because there's so much in there. Guys, there's there's tons of relatable information in this, but one of the things you talked about um, was your glimmer of hope when you attended a uh, Sun Valley Sustainable Conference in 2006. Can you describe what that was and what you brought back with you to Japan? Yeah, it was a really remarkable uh, experience for me and kind of a turning point. Um, I had gotten to know William McDonough uh, a, a little bit. We had, you know, emailed back and forth for a few things. And um, through his uh, interest, I was invited uh, to this conference. It was in 2006 in Sun Valley uh, and sponsored and organized by Teresa Heinz, who, uh, as you know, was a very, very important philanthropist for environmental issues. And it brought together just leaders from many fields of sustainability, uh, most of whom had been working on uh, issues for, you know, a decade or two decades or longer. And I noticed that they had a lot of shared uh, interest. They were able to um, uh, plan to work together, like the forestry people wanted to work with the watershed people, the people working on, you know, prairie restoration wanted to know what the uh, livestock people uh, were learning. Uh, and there was just this coming together, kind of a shared set of values that they were looking at how they were all interconnected. How did their individual spheres interconnect? And at the time, I was I was invited specifically to talk about uh, compact housing, which was another area that I've done a lot of research and writing on. Uh, specifically, you know, we would call it small uh, ecological footprint housing in Japan. And uh, through my conversations, I thought, well, I've been hearing a lot and over the years of my research about traditional Japanese lifestyles and their sustainable aspects. Maybe it's a good time to to write about that, to share it with the um, overseas community. So that's really what sparked it off. The fact that there was already this coming together and an awareness that things were interconnected and we needed to focus on those connections. And that's very true. Everything is connected. Joel, did you want to jump in? So, so how does your so is this kind of like the natural progression? So you went to you you went to school in Yale, at Yale for sculpture and architecture. Did you how did this <laughs> how did this all come together? I mean, obviously, there's like a natural progression to go from that into the architecture and studying the environmental impact. But mm -hmm. do you think that was intentional, or is it just kind of 
it, the way you went. It's a it's a passage of discovery, and yeah. of uh, as we all look and keep our uh, eyes open for uh, things that seem meaningful that we can do. Uh, this, these opportunities just sort of presented themselves. So when I was at Yale, uh, I was very interested in handcraft and and traditional building, uh, timber framing, etc. Uh, and at the time, there was really almost no tradition. Not a lot of that was being done in the U.S. I have to think this is the 1970s. I, I graduated in 1980. So um, the revival of timber framing and that kind of building was just beginning. So you could find a handful of books and I would go to the library at the university and find carpentry manuals from the 19th century. And, and I taught myself how to make mortises and tenons and things. And I found people to work with who were restoring old houses in New Haven. And I just learned and sort of taught myself. So I was interested in the joinery and, and that kind of carpentry. And the Japanese techniques seemed to be just so much more advanced and interesting than that. Uh, yeah. And But the work that I was doing, the other architecture work, even before I finished college, was what we would consider sustainable architecture. Uh, passive, passive solar, uh, low energy, using recycled materials. We would literally scrounge demolition sites for stone and 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 and, and brick and things like that. I love uh, that. Yeah. So <laughs> this is the people that I was working with. So it was sort of natural that when I went to Japan, I was looking in that direction. But I didn't um, expect to be there as long as I've been there. It's been over thirty years. So that's kind of kind of a big deal. Oh, that's amazing. It's mm. funny that you mentioned the passive solar. Sorry, sorry if I'm just jumping mm. in here, but no. I, live out, I live out in the desert and so in mm. the Palm Springs area. And so I think one thing that was fascinating to me was we had a place out here many years ago and it was a mid-century house. And you, I started learning about the architecture and the architects were behind it. Like they were imagining the way that the sun hit the house. So they would design the overhangs differently. So that way in the summer, you wouldn't get as much of the direct sunlight, but then in the winter time, you would get more of the passive solar heat to come in onto the concrete floors. And once I started learning that, I'm like, it was fascinating because you start realizing, okay, it's really considered the way the house, the, the properties were built, the materials that were used, the way that they were placed on the land. I mean, it was, it's really fascinating. There's more behind it than we think about sometimes. It's like, oh, you're going to have a nice view. Yeah. <laughs> so, Oh, yeah, yeah well-designed houses are yeah. always that way. They should be that way. I mean, our sense of beauty, I think, should include these kinds yeah. of aspects. How does it work environmentally? How does it work yeah. in terms of resources? How does it work in terms of energy use? And, of course, the indigenous solutions, uh, the American Southwest, were fantastic, Pueblos. And yeah. we know Frank Lloyd Wright did fantastic desert houses that were passive solar. So there is a long tradition of that. And yeah. I would say, sure, in the case of Japan, too, we can consider this an indigenous tradition that had solved a lot of the same problems that we're facing now. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of nice that these trains of thought are, are they're kind of, it's it's a cyclical, I mean, like everything in life is cyclical. I mean, look at bootcut jeans, but I digress. Oh. And so but I mean, it's like all these different things, <laughs> you know, we go through them and we appreciate them and then we're like, eh, whatever, we're going to move on to the next fad. But then they always come back for like, oh, oh, crap, that was the way we should have done it. Yeah. Part of it is because the problems don't go away. <laughs> Where is that? <clears throat> and and if anything, it's gotten worse. Yeah. yeah. So speaking of, of that, yeah. you see your book does focus on the Edo period, which is yeah. the 1600s. Yeah. Um, right. What I took from the what you sent me the when I was able to read it, um, I didn't realize that during that time frame that the Japanese society almost collapsed due mm. to the environmental degradation. Could you explain that and why, you know, 1603, you don't think about that hmm. of environmental degradation. So what happened and how did they fix it and what can we learn? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, well, you know, it's it's not unknown for, for countries or entire civilizations to collapse because of environmental destruction. Uh, and this has happened in many places in the world over, over time. And in the case of Japan, the, the Edo period, which began in 1603 uh, and lasted until the country opened to the West, in other words, began uh, modernizing in the 1860s. So this is about 250 years, more than 250 years. Um, before that period was uh, two centuries of civil war and one warlord fighting another uh, this constant battles for dominance of the entire country. And eventually uh, the shogun called uh, Hideyoshi won and, and was able to unite the country. But um, during that process, they deforested most of the country. 
cutting down forests for building castles, for building navies. Uh, cities would be burned down and have to be rebuilt. Of course, there's other attrition, other reasons for fires that are not related to war that required cities to be rebuilt. Uh, so it was deforestation that caused it. And the deforestation was leading to, for instance, watershed damage, uh, water, you know, landslides silting up the rivers, uh, the rivers get silted up, that's you know, damaging the, 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 the fish and the, the, the life in there. Uh, it's also leading to unpredictable flooding, uh, which is damaging agriculture. And if you damage agriculture, then you might get famines. And it's just this cascade of, uh, of falling dominoes. And through the wisdom of the leadership and also the values of the society of the time, uh, they understood that protecting the forest should be paramount. And they yeah. took measures to protect the force, legal measures and then social measures. And maybe it took the better part of a century. Maybe it took two generations, but they developed what we would call restorative, regenerative forestry, where if you cut a tree, you have to plant five more because only one of those is going to survive. And they did that consistently and bequeathed this great tradition of, of forest preservation to the nation. And a dozen, hundreds of other spin-offs uh, of what we would consider environmental solutions or circular solutions. You know, one of the things when you and I previously spoke was um, <coughs> waste is taboo because everything is connected. As you just went through, everything affects everything else and we all intertwine with our spheres of knowledge and what we, you know, everything is affected. Now the waste aspect, one thing that I didn't realize is they use everything. So when you were telling me that um, harvesting rice and the, the stalks from, you know, after they get the rice out and they weave mats out of that or materials that, you know, they can use it. So nothing's wasted. We need to learn that. <laughs> we're a little behind the eight ball on this because we generate a massive amount of waste. Yeah, uh, it's true. I mean, for the Japanese of the time, uh, again, it, it's a bit of a cliche, but it's an island nation. Uh, yeah. It actually would be considered resource poor for most resources. Very good uh, fresh water, uh, other resources. Uh, they could maintain the forest resources, as I mentioned. But for other things like metals, and uh, there's not a lot of agricultural land because it's so mountainous. It's very, very difficult. So they were working under great constraints of resources and and having a large population, a growing population. I mean, during this period, there was like 30 million people in the country which is like Poland now or Venezuela now. I mean, these are big countries. So um, through that, it was th from necessity that things uh, couldn't be wasted. And byproducts like the rice straw, which is left over after growing the rice to eat, well, that's going to be made use of. And what was interesting to me is that the value system evolved so that a wasteful person was seen as an ugly person. <laughs> in oh, other wow. words, yeah, no one was really admiring the person who was over consuming. I mean, some people had to. Uh, the I more powerful, <laughs> more powerful elites, they, they had to keep up a show. And there were certainly wealthy merchants who were, you know, doing conspicuous consumption. But by and large, those were ugly people. Wow. Uh, so there was a kind of social censure. I mean, it's kind of if you imagine someone driving their big, you know, vehicle down the street and people going gross instead of going cool. So yeah. this yeah. is this is the value, the value set. But this led to everything. I mean, everything had a value. They found a re reuse value for everything, whether it was rice straw for making mats or bags or raincoats or hats or sandals or whatever. Or um, or after you would burn the rice straw, for instance, if you, you would burn it for fuel. And then the, the ashes themselves were valuable because they were high in potassium. So you could use that for uh, metallurgy or for ceramics or for making abrasives or a bunch of other things. Uh, or the easiest thing is you could just take that rice straw uh, and then put it back in the agricultural cycle as, as mulch or, or as a compost. So it was very, very uh, circular and cyclical. And they understood where everything went. So everything had a reuse. You could re Most people used recycled paper most of the time. Uh, it had been written on, you know, with black ink. So when they recycled, it was gray, gray color. Yep. And they called it Nezumi, which means mouse. It was mouse colored paper. And that was the day-to-day, -day, you know, notepad. Uh, they recycled cooking oil. They recycled everything from ceramics to, you know, umbrellas to, you know, uh, I mean, everything. And a building, building material. This is a great thing. Maybe Joel will be interested to know. Um, you could dismantle 
Japanese buildings because they were put together with mortises and tenons and wedges and pegs. They were yeah. built to be dismantled. And when a building was at its end of life, uh, they would be dismantled and people would converge on the site and buy everything. Uh, because the, the timbers, the beams, the columns and beams, they were actually lumber yards uh, in the city of Edo, which is now Tokyo, but in other big cities that sold only recycled timber because it's oh, modular. Wow. It's a modular design with these tatami mat modules. So the dimensions would work out and you yeah. could just buy re recycled timber. They would buy the tatami mats or buy the sliding screens or those things were modular. They would fit in someone else's house. All of it, the, the roof tiles, everything would, would be recycled and, and reused. So this was just a matter of, of course, and there were economic incentives for that for most people. See, that's great because I feel like we, the world we live in now where it's like if we start looking at, mm. you know, let's, let's be realistic. We live in a very materialistic world right now. We just do where it's kind of like whatever you have on, if you can flash it on Instagram, you're in good shape. But I mean, <laughs> the thought of being able to actually, first of all, build something that's meant to be repurposed and reused. Yes. And that's going to have a longer lifespan versus just saying, okay, we're going to put this building up 20 years later. We demolish the whole thing. Then we start yeah. from scratch. Yeah, you yeah. Know, so that mentality is is freaking brilliant. God, yeah, yeah there's a notion of, of buildings as resource banks. This yeah. is something I've heard recently that, yes, we should think of buildings as resource banks. You are using those materials for a certain period of time for that building, and then they go back to be reused. I mean, um, I mentioned this to a big uh, Japanese real estate company who asked me to do some talks about Edo. And I said, yes, uh, you think because they're saying, oh, we're sustainable. We're working on sustainability. I said, have you thought about your buildings as resource banks? And the guy's face went blank. He was thinking, oh, my God, you know, what would it take <laughs> to actually implement that? to change the way they're doing things on such a scale. And I said, I really hope you guys think about that because it could have a real big positive impact. But it's the cost of having the long-term impact. That's what people, mm. I, you yeah. know, we all live in that world where it's like what you have to spend, the amount you have to spend to get more of a quality product that will last longer, mm. you know, versus whether it's fast fashion or it's anything like that. We live in a disposable society because right. cheaper. Versus yeah. thinking like I'm going to invest in quality that will last and I can pass it down or it can be yeah. reused. More, yeah. more, more. <laughs> and I know, and I know you guys think a lot about you know these hidden costs, the embodied costs, the embodied energy costs, the the, the water costs, and these are simply costs that are hidden. If you were in Japan in the 16th, 17th century, uh, you know those were not hidden. They were hitting you in the face. Uh, on, on the contrary. So, um, and this was, again, the need for, for um, coming up with solutions that solved many problems was very, very important. And I talk about, you know, we have the expression, kill two birds with one stone. Yeah. And I, I say that the Edo period uh, Japanese were finding ways to kill five or six or 10 with one stone, uh, something like the public bath, okay? Uh, Japanese were very hygienic and very, very few people had a bath at home but there were public baths called sento uh, in every neighborhood and they could you know bathe 200 300 people in one day uh <laughs> using a fairly small amount of energy to do that uh okay, they, they were using cool. firewood yeah and and it wasn't like someone from the top down said oh we have to find a way to use less energy for bathing it was just oh there's this huge economic incentive and in the process this public bath becomes a social center. Uh, it has a lots of lots of other, um, you know, uh, I indications about sustainable thinking. Like, for instance, if you went to the public bath for your price of admission, you would get only one bucket of hot water for your own use. You could use all the cold water you want, but it's one bucket of hot water. But you could sit in the big bathtub and soak as long as you wanted. So yeah. this was, you know, you yeah. lost your <laughs> hot this water is, is precious crazy. because it uses fuel. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah but and, and it actually right. uses, there's an honorific attached to it. Like O cha means honorable tea. O-U is honorable hot water because it's, you know, it's a valuable thing. So there's millions of spin-offs like that. But one thing that I try to stress is that I, I don't, I'm not recommending that people try to adopt these specific technologies that were in use in the Edo period or, or the same materials. It's not about that. It's about approaching the problem and looking at how things are connected. And if you understand, oh yeah, there's a vector connecting energy and water uh, mm -hmm. that we yeah. encounter when we use hot water. And, and we should look at the vector and everything upstream and downstream of that and see what we can do to, to maximize that or at least minimize uh, any negative effects. That's why I love the title of your book. It's called Just Enough for a Reason. People have to learn what their just enough is. Yeah. 
Don't it's a very over Japanese kind of a Zen thing. It's yeah. also, I mean, traditional religions, uh, you know, Shinto is one, it's sort of animistic and it, it uh, predates Buddhism in Japan. It's really ancient and basically everything's a God and the mountains and the winds and the water and everything. And, and humans are only one part of that and not the most important part. So yeah. everything has to be kept in balance and, and problems right. occur when things get out of balance. So that's that thinking. And the other comes from Zen Buddhism, which, you know, basically says, get rid of everything you don't absolutely need. Uh, you know, get rid of it, get rid of it. Think about what's enjoy. essential. <laughs> yeah. So these are kind of these, you know, trickle up, trickle up values that eventually uh, affect people. Uh, and uh, they rely on that. If you don't really need it, uh, then you don't you don't have to try to, you know, have it. You don't have to try to, yeah. uh, you know, don't need to be materialistic in that way. Other Other aspect is that people's houses were pretty small. I mean, farmhouses could be very big, but exactly. in the urban centers, they were very small. People were living in one room. And living yeah. pretty well, a pretty high quality of life in one room. And everything was compact and could be put away. And they just didn't have stuff. They just didn't have stuff. So We don't really need most of the stuff we got. <laughs> yeah. Well, other thing is a lot of ideas that are circulating now, again, in I say certainly in relation to circular e economy, for instance, uh, rental, renting uh, and sharing and things, that was, that was par for the course. Everyone was sharing things. Uh, you can rent everything from bedding to, you know, footwear to, you know, your cook stove to, you know, you name it. You didn't have to own it. Yeah. And then things were available simply on the street. You would go and you would find vendors who were who had uh, used fuel to cook food and you didn't have to use your own fuel. You could just buy the food for a small cost and, and have cooked food. Meanwhile, there was lots of ways to prepare food without cooking it uh, through drying or pickling or other preservation. And a lot of things like sushi, which is eaten uh, cold. Uh, you don't have to cook the fish. Uh, and this is not because someone said, oh, we need to find a way to eat fish without cooking it. It was like, wow, we can do this and we don't have to cook it. And great. You know, it's fine. And it's so, delicious. <laughs> yeah. And beautiful. And the other and side beautiful. of this is that that was it was a world awash in beauty. I mean, everything was yeah. beautiful there to us. And it's not this is not romanticism. You just look at these things and go, oh, my God, look at the, the human sensibility, the sense of materials, yeah. the sense of design. And most things also had that added beauty of uh, their environmental sensibility, uh, being recyclable, being, uh, you know, efficient yeah. in their some materials, not overusing yeah. materials. So uh, it was a great, a, a wonderful, wonderful culture that we can learn a lot from. So uh, that, do, do you ahead. ever look back at the time when you could have had this apprenticeship? I'm sorry, like this one just popped in my head. Like, do you ever just look at back and be like, where would I be now had I done that? Or I'm wishing I would have done that. Oh, good 20s. Looking back and looking back, yeah, we always look back. And I'm glad I don't have regrets, but I do think, yeah, what would have happened? Because uh, I yeah. do love building and I do love woodwork. And I, I find time to do that now, making sculpture and other things. And I enjoy working on architecture projects. I would have been a different person, I think. I probably would have been more centered I probably would have lived a simpler life. I doubt that I would maybe be writing as much or or, or doing things like this conversation uh, because to be a real good carpenter in the Japanese fashion it is an all-consuming uh, lifestyle and it, it's actually a path. And I, I, I talk about Master Nishioka. Uh, he was a Buddhist. He was, a, again, a devout Buddhist. And um, he... I believe, uh, saw his primary role in terms of his, his apprentices as providing them a path through life. And this path in the Buddhist sense of maybe towards enlightenment, uh, that to, to find work that was devotional, uh, that subsumed their egos, that uh, allowed them to discover what was really most important and how they fit into the big picture of the world. And I, I don't know that many of his apprentices saw that that was going on, uh, but I do know that some did, and, and 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 many of them have continued. But you know, it's a hard life, and I think I would have been happy. I would have felt uh, accomplished in a way, uh, but I didn't. Instead, I've tried to find other ways to convey what that was all about and to uh, hopefully inspire other people. That's, I mean, again, this book wouldn't have happened if you hadn't done everything that you've done. And I, I love what you've done. <laughs> yeah, well, and again, it's directly connected. I think I write about it in the, the forward. Uh, when I would ask Master Nishioka questions, and here's the thing, you know, he's a master carpenter. His, his apprentices never get to ask him questions. They have what they call the 
the stolen lessons. You just sort of, they sort of look out the corner of their eye and see what he's doing. And then they try to mimic it. Right. And if they ask a question, it's like, wham, you know, you can't ask questions, but I was not his apprentice. I was there to document and he made time to talk to me and I would come with a question, master, why do you do things this way? Uh, and he would give an answer that was almost always circling back to environmental aspects, to the trees as living beings, uh, that are shaped by the environment in which they grew and that the influence of that environment will persist uh, throughout the, the, the use span, the lifespan of that tree, even after it's part of a temple. So where the wind came from, what the moisture was like, etc. that this, this affects the character of the tree. And it was all about environment. You know, where was the wind? Where was the sun? Where was the water? What's a good forest like? What's a healthy forest? What's an unhealthy forest? And, and it's very unfortunate because in Japan, it had been deforested, I mentioned, in the Edo period. The master's work uh, basically began through uh, taking care of temples that were over a thousand years old in Nara. Horyuji Temple and the Yakuji Temple, they were 1,300 years old. At the time, they were fantastic forests of this beautiful tree called Hinoki. It's a kind of cypress, wonderfully aromatic, resilient tree, uh, which is almost gone in Japan. And in fact, in the Edo period, it started to disappear. So he, he was trying to work through this lack of adequate timber supplies uh, of the kind of species he wanted. And in fact, had to go to Taiwan to find similar trees. Uh, basically, though, he was talking about good forests and uh, uh, what we need to, to, to know, the sensibility we have to develop in order to perceive this. And these guys had like superhuman perception, if you ask me. They could look at the, they could, they could smell wood and say, uh, this came from such and such a, a valley. Said, How do you know? Said, By the way, it smells. How do you know? And, you know, they would. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was amazing. Uh, and these, these are traditions that were handed down. I mean, this is not in a textbook. This is learning from a master to apprentice over centuries and centuries, over a millennium, really. Well, it's, because it's an actual, it's an actual, like we're saying, it's not just a skill of like, how do you do this? It really is an art. And so you have to learn this from a master and you really do mm -hmm. learn it by doing. And do, in order to do something like that, that's how it works. Um, but I guess, and I'm sorry if I'm asking too many questions here, but as <laughs> you like learn, <laughs> all the studying and the history, how has it impacted the way you live your life? Like, yeah. I mean, you learned about like the deforestation and all this stuff that happened what how have you changed yeah it it has definitely shaped my work and uh i spend i have a lot of time i spend a lot of time on projects that involve restoration for instance of farmhouses uh a lot of time uh talking to people about these issues and subjects things that i think they need to keep in mind uh as an educator uh, I've been teaching university for, for more than 20 years. It, it, it plays a large role in, in what I'm teaching. Uh, in my own uh, life, I try to be thoughtful. And I know, um, you know, if, if I had a, a list of things that I think we should all try to do uh, to live more sustainably, uh, more circularly, I, I, you know, would look at that and say, yeah, and each one presents a challenge and a personal challenge for me to try to do, whether it's, you know, uh, trying to plant trees. Uh, I'd like to support tree planting, uh, but it's hard to find a situation where that can be done in an effective way. Uh, I like the idea of, of composting all the garbage, but, you know, again, if the entire household is not involved with that, if the entire neighborhood's not involved with that, then where's the impact? Uh, I like the idea of, you know, minimizing energy use, but again, um, without a kind of overall system uh, within the society, within the culture or a particular region that is based on that, then again, the impacts are not going to be significant enough to really make a difference. So it's, it's a constant thing. But I personally, it's made me very reflective, uh, mm -hmm. thinking about where things come from. You know, how did they get to us? You know, whether it's a book or this computer or, you know, my, my, my shoes, you know, yeah. how, did, how did they get to us? What were they made of? Where'd that come from? And what's going to happen to it afterwards? And simply reflecting on that, to me, uh, changes my decision making. So yeah. I, I would like to try to share, again, you know, their stories. It's about stories. Everything has a story. And I like people to think about that. And yeah, we all have to think about where does it originally come from? How did it get here? How far did it travel? Yeah. Was your, were your shoes made in three different places, assembled somewhere else, and then shipped to you? 
Yeah. People generally don't think about that, but um, no, we generally don't. We generally yeah. don't. And it's as if there's this huge veil, you know, uh, yeah. sort of hiding all that stuff, all the unpleasant realities to things. And but you guys have been working on this for a long time, I know. And I've been working on it for a long time. Many of us have been thinking and talking about this for decades. And, and little by little, we see growth in interest and awareness. We see that. Uh, yeah. And sometimes accompanied by actual policies, whether it's, you know, governmental policy on resource use or on waste, et cetera. Sometimes we see this energy policy, but it's such a, a hard slog. It's, and I would say, especially for the United States, because there is yeah. such a strong anti, anti, you know, sustainable movement going on there. Whereas Europe, it's far ahead of us. And oh Japan is sort of in between. It could if they really wanted to, but, you know, basically the, it's hard to get Japanese corporations and government to do things differently. It's hard yeah. to get them to change. So. No, change is hard for us, especially in the States. We are, mm -hmm. we are behind. Mm -hmm. so I, we talk to a lot of experts that are not, they're from other countries, not Americans. And it's just alarming how far behind we are. And we're working on it. We are working on yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, we have a huge and impact. And that's been the interesting part, I think, over the past few years is we are watching, we're literally watching the culture shift. Yeah. And it's happening by, it's so, it's so funny because it's like, normally things take forever to mm. happen, but it mm. feels like we're going by leaps and bounds and things are happening at such a fast pace now. And you know, I've said this numerous times, it always comes down to the dollar. It will yeah. always come down to the buck. And so it's like, yeah. if there's yeah. money to be made somewhere, I think that's where you start seeing the cultural shift happen. I absolutely agree. And I would again point to, you know, out of period Japan, um, it wasn't in some cases there were, you know, governmental regulations like you can't cut the trees, you know, yeah. in this mountain. But most of it was because there was a financial incentive for people to do things in a certain way. Uh, yeah. There were markets for uh, recycled materials for reusing things. Uh, they could actually sell this stuff or they could buy things more inexpensively if they bought that kind of product. Clothing, beautiful Japanese kimonos. Uh, especially in the cities, people um, wore used kimonos. There were 500 used kimono sellers in, in the city of Edo. Uh, and people thought nothing of, of just going with their kimono they're tired of and trading it in for oh, someone yeah. else's used kimono. There was no shame, nothing bad there. It's like we would go to a vintage clothing store kind of a thing. Uh, it, it, it simply was economical for them. So uh, I guess, you know, that shift... With all of the engines and the drivers of consumption and advertising, my, my little pooch is yapping. Um, okay. We like <laughs> dogs. Is, anybody, is everybody else hearing this? Oh. oh, yeah, here she is. Um, so, with all the drivers, you know, encouraging us to consume, uh, it's really difficult, right? It's really yeah. difficult to to. Well, we've been sold. The, we have been advertised and sold to buy, 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 buy for yeah. generations. We're good at it. That's we're something really that we do at well, at <laughs> right? As because society. It's like you said that you slap the word vintage on it and now it's perfectly fine to buy right. used. Right. Yeah. Of course, green is now, of course, a, you know, a sales point. It's been for a long time and it's accompanied by greenwash. We see a lot of that. Oh, uh, yeah. But here's another interesting thing. You know, I was talking with uh, someone not too long ago uh, about uh, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN, yeah. which are now very common and very familiar to people here in Japan. Uh, I was on a bus the other day and I had posters inside, you know, about the SDGs. What are we doing for the SDGs? You go to any government office and there's a big poster and people are wearing a little circular pin. It's got this rainbow color. This is the SDGs, right? Uh, people know about that. But this person I was speaking with in America who was in, interested in sustainable design didn't really know about it at all. And so this is a huge difference. And here there's a lot of buy-in from industry and, and government for, for instance, the sustainable development goals. Uh, how much of that is translating into actual effective action is an open question. Again, a lot of it is greenwash and they just want to be seen as doing that. But uh, the same for yeah. circularity, for circular economy. I do see more and more companies uh, in, in Japan and abroad very uh, infrequently in the U.S. who are now advertising uh, the ways in which they're circular. And yep. I was surprised. I was at Ikea the other day. Ikea is very popular here. Ikea, we call it. Ikea. Okay. Ikea, okay. Ikea. And uh, here it's called Ikea. And there was a big, um, you know, monitor showing this well done, slick animation video thing about how circular uh, Ikea uh, is trying to be. 
and everything wow. they're, they're designing is to be reused and all the ways you can reuse this stuff. Of course, it's a big question. I mean, let's face it. Uh, most of the furniture is mostly air. They're hollow, you know, it's like <laughs> of, like, very insubstantial stuff. But I don't know that it's very sustainable, right? But they were trying to, you know, persuade people they're, that they're they really on it. taking it seriously. And they have huge impact globally. So well, I hope Scandinavia in general is pretty good. Really? Yeah, in general, in general. For forestry, yeah. for sure. They're, yeah. they're again fantastic for forestry. Lots of northern Europe. Germany is great for forestry, for other things. But so this has taken root at that level, and that's the level that we needed to take root on to have a big effect. So in the US, what do you think some of the bigger targets should be? Automotive industry, building industry? Yeah. What do you and think? construction industry has got a huge target. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, there's so many industries that have to be, I mean, where do you even begin? I mean, just, I mean, if you start looking at the United States, just the impact physically of the, of the scale of the country, mm. you're comparing to others like to try to do that. It's, it's, a, it's absolutely incredible. I mean, yeah. it's, it's overwhelming, but I think we're seeing it. I think we're seeing it, you know, coal is starting to go away. I think, you know, yeah. we're starting to see the transfer over to electric cars. We're starting to see the hydrogen. We're starting to see solar become more cost effective mm -hmm. and push mm -hmm. power that, you know, and then we start into Ikea. I believe Ikea is making a commitment to their packaging is toning down. I believe yep. they're going to mm -hmm. all plastics as well for that, that are like on the pegs and things like that. I think they're, mm -hmm. so I believe they're actually making, the bigger, it's interesting to watch. I mean, there's, yeah. there's a point. Sorry. So you, you, you feel you, you can detect the shift happening, sort of a positive yeah. shift happening. Because the, we're seeing that the money is there. And I, honestly, yeah. I will always say that it comes down to the corporations have to make a buck. And if the yeah. society is telling you we're only spending it if you make these changes, that's when the changes will happen. Exactly. People yeah. vote with their feet and they mm -hmm. vote with their pocketbook. And, exactly. and when we demand better products in these ways, then, then industry is likely to respond. It may drag its feet, and we see this constantly. Oh, uh, the, for the changes we're talking about should have happened 20 years ago, at yeah. least, right? At least. But at least they're happening now. And, and yeah. again, it's partly because it's more and more difficult to deny that climate is changing and having disastrous effects, right? I mean, this is wild. Uh, really, it's it's shocking in every every region of the U.S. Even and and a lot of my most you know climate change denial relatives, even they're sort of coming around. So this is a big deal. Uh, and again, it comes down to cost. They see the yeah. cost. Whereas yeah. I argued decades ago, uh, what is the downside to shifting to uh, renewable energy? What is the downside? Yeah. I keep telling what people, what do you love about exhaust fumes? Just let yeah, me know. What is the, what is the <laughs> downside? There's a cost, implementation cost, and, and a cost to shift to this stuff. But in the long term, what is the downside? And again, and Joel, you talked about this, the notion of long term. And, and I'll loop back both to Edo period and then back to uh, the Temple Carpenter. Um, they were thinking in the span of centuries or millennia. And the thinking yeah. of like the Edo period, like they're using the same farm plots for centuries. For centuries, they continued to be productive. They were restoring the, the the fertility of the land. They were using human waste at some point eventually to help do that. Uh, they could live in the same place for centuries uh, continually. And this is when people say, "What does sustainable mean?" Well, it means that it can continue indefinitely. And yeah. and they succeeded in doing this. It was a matter of course. There weren't there weren't huge lands to the west to be opened up, and they could just pick up and move. Right. Uh, they didn't. They, they stayed there and they had to make do and, and it required a great uh, uh, finesse in the use of resources and, and the, the surrounding forest and their water supply as, as well. Uh, the temple carpenters are thinking in terms of a, a thousand years. You know, the trees that they used for the comms were a thousand years old. Yep. And if they build the temple well, it can be uh, in use for over a thousand years. And, and Master Nishoka would get criticized occasionally. I mean, he passed away in the 1990s, but, you know, criticized. Well, why, are there, why are you building temple in this very expensive, time-consuming way? It's taking decades to build this one temple complex. Because, uh, it's so expensive. And he said, if you amortize it over time, over a thousand years, it's free. <laughs> yes. That is a brilliant way to think about it. Now, yeah. I mean, going back to your, your book just enough, it's like an instruction book. I mean, it has mm. tons of information, ideas, the drawings of how mm. things are done and the effects and how everything affects each other. Where can people buy your book? Because it comes out in April Yeah, and you can pre-order it. So where, where, where can people get this? Because it's an amazing book. Yeah. 
uh, again, thank you. I'm glad you 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 enjoy and uh, appreciate it. Uh, and yeah, I spent a lot of time. I spent a year just on the drums. Uh, oh, of course, I was teaching and doing other things. So well, not every day, but uh, I spent a long time in the drawings. And I, I don't wanted say the not to be a big part. part. Don't say the not every day part. Yeah, <laughs> every day, every day, uh, from morning till night. Um, but uh, so I want people to be able to get the gist, to get the story by just looking at the illustration. So yeah. the book, uh, yes, it's been out of print for a while. And uh, the Stonebridge Press in the U.S. Uh, will be releasing it on April 10th. And it's available now for pre-order at all major online bookstores. And I encourage people uh, to go to a local bookstore and ask for it. Uh, yes. Because this is a way to encourage them to to stock it. If people come and ask for it, um, if one person does, they may, although order for that one person. If three people do, they're going to buy a bunch uh, and stock it. So I encourage that. But again, it is a re-release uh, of a book that first really came out um, in 2009. And, yes. and the story of that, to me, is interesting that there was interest, you know, at the time. Uh, and then it plateaued. And then over the last two years, there's been this incredible increase in interest in the subject and uh, people like you asking me to talk about it. And uh, I, I think that's a very interesting thing that the society maybe is shifting and they're more prepared now to absorb some of the lessons that I'm talking about. So I encourage people to either pre-order it online or go to your bookstore. Uh, it'll be ready just in a few weeks. Uh, and I think uh, you'll enjoy reading it. And right. definitely support the local stores. That is, that's definitely huge. local bookstores. Yes. Well, thank you for joining us. This has been exciting, everything that you're doing. And I'm very excited for your book coming out again. And I think people are finally ready. So I think we're going to see more growth and more people following the just enough credo of you don't need as much stuff as you think you do. So on that, guys, thank you so much. We will see you again soon. Take care. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye-bye.